So that took longer than expected. I have a confession to make. I made my last video with the intent to make a new one two weeks later, but as you can probably tell, that didn't quite happen. Around six months later, I'm finally ready to release my next deep dive in the political messaging and gaming. I know in my last video, I said the next one would be on Bioshock, but all the footage for that got deleted by accident. So I decided to pick up a new project and then come back to Bioshock at a later date. So without further ado, this is my political analysis of Disco Elysium. Disco Elysium is a very politically driven game with many dialogue options. There's a number of political leanings your character can take. Whether you're a diehard communist like the communards of the past or a moralist neoliberal of the coalition, your decisions affect everything in Disco Elysium. So today we're gonna take a larger look at the game and the politics presented within. It's a phenomenal game and the devs clearly cared so much about the game that they were working on when they made it. However, if you're just not gonna play it or you have played it and it's been a while, I'm gonna recap for you the story so that you have a greater context on the world as it's presented to the player. I will also add that I am only recapping the version of the story as it was presented to me. So there are a few divergences that are possible, but I didn't wanna spoil everything about the game and these divergences won't really affect the overall point I'm trying to make with this video. If you would like to avoid spoilers, please go to the timestamp on screen now. I will try my best to keep the video spoiler free from that point on. Our story starts with our character waking up in a trashed hotel room within the whirling and rags with a severe hangover and no memory of his own identity or the world around him. He meets Lieutenant Kim Kitsuragi, who informs him that they have been assigned to investigate the death of a hanged man in the hotel's backyard. His identity is unknown, and initial investigation indicates that he was lynched by a group of union workers from the local dockyard. The detectives explore the rest of the district, following up on leads while helping residents around Martinez. You might help Morel, the cryptozoologist, find the elusive cryptid known as the Insulindian Phasmid or help a group of kids set up a nightclub in an old abandoned church, or helping an old working class woman named Billy Mejin find her lost husband. Our character gradually learns that he is a decorated RCM detective, Lieutenant W. Freighter Harrier Harry Dubois. Harry experienced an event several years ago that began a series of benders, including one around Martinez where he dismissed the rest of his squad. Through their work, they discovered the killing is connected to an ongoing strike by the Union dock workers against the Wild Pines Corporation. Meeting up with Union boss Everard Clare and Wild Pines negotiator Joyce Messier, Joyce reveals that the hanged man named Lely was the commander of a squad of mercenaries sent by Wild Pines to break the strike and warns that the rest of the squad has gone rogue and formed a tribunal where they're planning on claiming vengeance on the men they believe to be responsible. This leads them to discover that Lely was killed before the hanging. The Hardy Boys, a group of dock workers who act as vigilante peacekeepers at Martinez, claim responsibility for the murder. They assert that Lely attempted to sexually assault a guest at the Whirling and Rags named Classier. They meet with Classier, who reveals that Lely was shot in the mouth while the two were having sex. Unable to figure out the origin of the bullet and fearful of the authorities due to her past as a corporate spy, Classier enlisted the help of a truck driver and union sympathizer named Ruby, who staged Lully's death with the rest of the Hardy Boys. The detectives find Ruby hiding in an abandoned building, where she incapacitates them with a pail device. She claims that the cover-up was Classier's idea, and had no idea who shot Lully. Harry manages to disable the pale device and tries to arrest her. Ruby, who believes Harry to be a corrupt cop, threatens to kill herself, but is ultimately allowed to leave by Harry. The detectives return to find themselves in a standoff between the mercenaries and the Hardy Boys, the former seeking revenge over Lily's death. A firefight breaks out and Harry is wounded, blacking out and waking up a few days later. 
most of the mercenaries are killed. The detectives begin chasing down their last leads, determining that the shot that killed Lily came from an old sea fort off the shore of Martinez. The detectives explore the fort and find the shooter, a former commissar from the Revachal Communist Army named Yosef Lilianovich Udros. Yosef reveals that he shot Lully in a fit of anger and jealousy. His motivations are born out of his bitterness towards the capitalist system Lully represented, as well as sexual envy for Classier. The detectives arrest him for the murder. At this point, an insectoid cryptid known as the Insulindian Phasmid appears from the reeds. Harry has a psychic conversation with the Phasmid, who tells Harry that it finds the notion of his unstable mind to be fearful, but is in awe at his ability to continue existing. It comforts Harry, telling him to move on from the wreck of his life. Harry and Kim are confronted by his old squad upon their return to Martinez. They reflect on Harry's actions during the game, whether he has solved the case and how he handled the mercenaries. Harry's usual partner, Lieutenant John Vickermere, confirms that Harry's emotional breakdown was the result of his ex fiance leaving him years ago. The squad expresses hope that Harry's state will improve in the future and invites him and Kim to join a special RCM unit. Disco Elysium takes place in a fictional world known as Elysium in the year 51 of the current century. With a confirmed population of 3.6 billion and rumored to be totaled at 4.6 billion, the world is made up of Isolas, which is this world's word for a continent. The main Isolas in this world are Mundi, Seol, Samara, Grad, Katla, Lumara, and Insulinda. While there is no official map of the world, on screen now is a fan-made map that was created by Reddit user Kajo Lions. I wanted to show this so you can get an idea of what the world might look like, but just keep in mind that this is not canon by any means. The main political forces in the world are the Moralist International, the Communists, and the Founding Party. While the Communists no longer hold much power in the world outside of Samara, it is the ideology we know the most about, as it was the last self-ruling government in Revachal, and therefore the last form of government the people of this country truly knew before being turned into an international economic zone to be exploited. The Founding Party is the world's oldest international organization, spending its time in search of either the re-emergence of the innocents or new members. Some of the members of the Founding Party was also responsible for electing Dolores Day, the main religious figure in this world. Though their religion is self-identified to be secular, it still holds belief and worship of Dolores Day as an almost Christ-like figure. The Founding Party would later go on to form the Moral Intern after her assassination in order to continue her political and intellectual project. The other members of the founding party from this time moved to Sir Le Clef and invented modern corporate finance. Fascists in this world aren't that common, but their presence is still noticeable. They view themselves as heirs to the rule of Franco Negro, the innocence of militarism and the unifier of serfdom territories into nations. The fascists consider Dolores Day to be an inadequate and weak ruler for her reluctance to subjugate other cultures. Fascism despises internationalism and places one's nation above all, which also means that the ideology is different based on which state is being analyzed. We'll primarily be looking at the fascists of Revachal since that's where we get the most details. Fascists in Revachal long for the days of the suzerain to return a time when the nation served as a giant colonial power, with influence reaching over Safra, Samara, Lilmara, Supramundi, and Saramariza. 
This royal family began a steep decline after Felipe III, the squanderer, spent most of the nation's treasury on opulent decorations, fancy ornamental weapons, and other needless luxuries. This opulence led to a growing communist movement within the empire's sphere of influence, ultimately leading in the last real ruler of Revachal, King Gulame, fleeing the country and leaving his nephew Frizzle to be the last suzerain as he was later defeated by the communist uprising in Revachal. Though the royal family's downfall was an inevitable consequence of their arrogance and extravagance, the fascists of Revachal still hold him in high regard. In modern times, under the rule of the Moral Intern and the Coalition of Nations, Revacholian fascists view societal issues as the result of a culture war, in which traditional and natural values are being eroded by a growing social degeneracy. This alleged degeneracy is just another way for fascists to rail against racial equality, gender equality, and homosexuality. They think that there is a global conspiracy by the state of Seoul to bring about the return of socialist ideology, intersolary travel, and emigration. They believe the only way to stop this is by establishing a strong nationalist state, guided by the moral values of the males of the dominant race. The Moralist International, or Moral Intern, is the main power in the world, representing 1.2 billion people from its annexed states. A very neoliberal centrist party, the Moral Intern was founded during the rule of Innocence Dolores Day, and encompasses a union between center-left and center-right parties from nations on the Real Belt, the Moral Intern's biggest zone of influence. They were responsible for siding with the Coalition of Nations to defeat the Communists during the Anton Centennial Revolution. The Moral Intern's policies include that of humanism, which is defined as an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. The moral in turn also emphasizes democratic values and promoting progress through incremental change. The Moral Intern maintain a number of international treaties and agreements, including the first Le Chaux Accord, which prohibits corporate espionage in certain territories. They also maintain the Articles of Dominion, meant to restrict certain types of information, and the Emergency, Wayfarer, and Elements Acts, which provide legal basis of Revachal's zone of control. The Moral Intern also manages subordinate groups, including EPIS, an international economic trade union. The International Collaboration Police, a group dedicated to intersolary law enforcement. The Institute of Price Stability, a measurement to contain economic inflation and preserve social stability. And the Human Development and Freedom Index, a measuring system meant to categorize nations by their quality of life. This system is not unlike the system in our world that defines countries as first, second, or third world where capitalist ruling countries and aligned allies are defined as first world. Communist countries and their allies are referred to as second world, and neutral developing countries are defined as third world. Today, this system mainly dictates if a country is a world leader or a developing country, but that's a topic for another day. The communists in Disco Elysium are only but a shadow of their former glory. Having managed to depose the kings of old, they succeeded in creating a socialist coalition of nations, starting with Grod, the birthplace of the revolution in the year 02, led by Krasmazov, the father of scientific communism, premier of the Communist Party of Shestengrad, and head of the 11-day government. The Gradian proletariat held power over the nation for six years, being known for burning churches and establishing labor camps for bourgeois opponents in southeast Grad. Samara was next to turn to communism, having first sprouted in the Senyao Commune, a province of the former Safra Empire. The commune was known for its weapon production, particularly the Triangong 4.46, which was supplied to Revisholian revolutionaries as military aid. The commune was extinguished by 06, giving way to the Samaran People's Republic, also known as the SRV, after the assault on Grad. At the time of the game, the SRV is the last bastion of anti-capitalism, though many foreigners believe the government to be repressive and led by a corrupt leader who has ruled for over three decades. 
There is not a lot that can be said about the SRV definitively, as there is a lot of propaganda both for and against the country, leaving the truth to be muddled at best and downright impossible to decipher at worst. The last of the communes, and the one we learn the most about in-game, was the Commune of Revachol. Communism gained traction in Revachol as a result of the ruling of King Felipe III, the last of a large line of disastrous suzerains. The Commune of Revachol was officially established in the 7th of March in the year 02, transmitting its legislative document, Le Decret de Mars, across intersolary borders, using technology seized from the Feld R&D building in Martinez. The Commune was led by dual commissars of revolution, Julia Doberve and John Abadenez, Serving alongside them were the political commissars, ensuring that the Revolutionary Army would answer to civilian control and abide to the Commune's ideology. The Commune's uprising was only successful thanks to the help of a bourgeoisie class who wished to overthrow the suzerain, known as the Ultra-Liberals, though they would later betray the Communists and join the Coalition of Nations. The Communards took control of Revachol after the death of suzerain Frizzel I. In 08, the coalition would come to retaliate, leading an attack known as Operation Death Blow, opening fire over Martinez, La Delta, and Stella Marie indiscriminately. Despite this, the commune would only officially fall two years later, after the disappearance of Dobreve and Abadenez, when the Revacholian Instrument of Surrender was signed, turning Revachol into a zone of control subject to the Moralist International. There was a lot for me to pick apart in this game politically, between the economic exploitation and colonization by the Moralist International through groups like EPIS and the Human Development and Freedom Index, the embarrassingly obtuse fascists or traditionalists, as they prefer to be called, all the way down to the politics of the role of police officers in a capitalist society. So please bear with me as I go into detail about as much as I can about this game's politics. I want to start with talking about the communists in this world, as many of the world's events can date the start of the dominoes falling to the anti-centennial revolution. The developers behind Disco Elysium are primarily from the country of Estonia, a former Soviet-controlled nation. Why I bring this up is it's impossible to separate the game's depiction of a post-communist country from the fact that they themselves lived through the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism in Eastern Europe. The communists in this world base their ideology on Mazovian thought, named after this world's father of communism, Krasmazov. Krasmazov's name and theories are based on the works of Karl Marx, while his history, use of pseudonyms, role in the Gradian Revolution, and subsequent leadership of the party is based on both Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin. His supposed suicide during the overthrow of Morova, as well as the belief it was faked, is similar to that of Chilean socialist leader Salvador Allende. Communist theory in this world holds that it is the historic role of the proletariat social class to rise up against its bourgeois oppressors, producing, through means of a dictatorship of the proletariat, a state which protects workers' interests. Although the process contrasts with anarchist theory, the two groups were allies during the revolution, though anarchist movements have largely been forgotten since the fall of the revolution at the hands of the Moralist International. Anarchists in the world of Disco Elysium share a similar place in history as anarchists in our own world, where they're often overshadowed and many times wiped out by the efforts of other communist movements. Whether we look to the Daruti Column in the Spanish Civil War, or the Revolutionary Insurrectionary Army of Ukraine, also known as the Black Army, during the Soviet Revolution. These factions fought valiantly during their respective wars, however, were eventually betrayed by their communist allies and forgotten about by wider capitalist societies. In fact, the Spanish Civil War might have been won by the communists had the communists not betrayed and withheld supplies from the anarchist armies. As for the Black Army, they were betrayed and executed by the Soviet Union when they were invited to a joint planning conference by the Red Army, where upon arrival, they were arrested and executed. There is no evidence of this happening in Disco Elysium, so we can either assume it didn't happen, that it happened in secret, 
or that the communist government simply never had a chance to do it, as the coalition's retaliation was pretty swift following their victory. The Moralist International is the main international government in a world of Elysium. They seek to control the world's economy through organizations like the Institute of Price Stability. This organization claims to maintain high levels of economic activity through the control of inflation, which is the gradual general increase in prices and fall in the purchasing value of money, which in turn creates high levels of employment. They view this as a necessary step of maintaining social stability. It ensures that everyday essential items maintain the same cost so that they're not too expensive and people can't afford them, and they're not too cheap where workers have no incentive to produce. The flaw in this thinking is that inflation is an inevitable fact of capitalism, and generally the way governments tend to combat inflation is by rejecting reforms that would benefit the working class, such as increasing the minimum wage. You can see this in the modern-day USA, where Republicans and many Democrats often strike down reforms like minimum wage increases, universal health care, and reduced or free college. Politicians view inflation as being caused by more money in the hands of people, where, in reality, inflation is caused by the increase of money in circulation, which happens every day as money is printed constantly, with the Bureau of Engraving and Printing producing 38 million notes a day with a face value of approximately $541 million. The Moralist International employs different government programs to exert control over other countries most prominently through the EPIS, a special program modeled after the European Union in our own world, developed by the Moral Intern to support certain Occidental nations. It started out as a system of weights and measures that standardized the usage of kilograms and centimeters, and after that success expanded into an economic union for the processing of steel. However, the next steps for EPIS is the plan to turn it into a supranational political alliance, the United States of the Occident. In order to become a full member of EPIS, countries must go through an admission process to show that they have concern for the rule of law. However, one example of a country attempting to join EPIS is Kedra, who has been in negotiations for membership since 21. Some even believing that candidate members never become full members, which could mean that countries are being exploited with the promise of the benefits of membership at the cost of having to adapt to the moral interns' political system and adopting their rule of law. The game makes a point to criticize the liberal regime of the moral intern. The devs even say in an interview with RPG Fan that there is a global phenomenon of dissatisfaction with the liberal technocratic order with rising conflicts in different countries of re-emerging ideologies both on the left and the right that many people, especially the people who tend to run governments, corporations, and major media outlets, had long assumed were dead and buried, while in fact they never left. Fascists in this world are not unlike fascists in our own world. Primarily believing in pseudoscience and lies preached to them by demagogues, their sense of reality is so distorted that they'll genuinely believe certain races or sexes to be superior to others. This pseudoscience can be things like eugenics and race theory. Some fascists will gladly spew their nonsense openly, but many choose to rather speak through dog whistles or secret phrases that allow other fascists to identify each other. In the game, we can see an example of this with Gary the Crypto Fascist, who repeatedly uses the phrase, Welcome to Revacal, which appears to be a dog whistle, though I have no way of knowing currently what exactly it's supposed to mean. In our world, there are many fascists and even more dog whistles, but I could make an entire video calling these out. For time's sake, however, I'll just name a few prominent fascists you may have heard of. There's people like Charlie Kirk, Ben Shapiro, Richard Spencer, and Steven Crowder, along with more prominent figures like Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump. I'll go into more detail about modern-day fascism in a future video, so hit the subscribe button if you'd like to learn more about that. The police in this world, specifically in Revachal, are a group called the Revachal Citizens Militia. They are a Peace Corps that was organized out of the ruins of the landing, the event in which the Coalition of Nations finally took Revachal. While the RCM is recognized as the legal authority in Revachal, they do have their flaws. They rely on donations and good PR to keep running. There are many who believe the RCM to be corrupt and 
mismanaged, and there's little cooperation between precincts. The rivalry between Precinct 41 and Precinct 57 is highlighted in this game as your partner on the case is from Precinct 57, while Harry is from 41. The RCM also relies on volunteers rather than professionally trained officials. This results in a lot of incompetence in the field. Clearing only 10 cases a year is enough to put you in the 90th percentile. In fact, it is stated that more than 71% of murders go unsolved. The police in this world are heavily inspired by classic Vespertine cop shows, both in terms of artistic inspiration and within the world. With detective novels like Dick Mullins being a popular choice of reading by many of the cops in this world. Maybe this inspiration from romanticized novels is what results in so many RCM officers killing people in the line of duty. It's said in game that the average cop kills people pretty regularly, especially in Precinct 41 where Harry is stationed. With one officer being quoted as saying, It's just like brushing my teeth, I do it once or twice a week and don't really think about it, without a trace of guilt in his voice. Cops in our world are similarly inspired by romanticized depictions of their profession. With movies like Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, and shows like Law & Order, Columbo, and TJ Hooker, along with police trainers like Lt. Col. Dave Grossman, who trains police to look out for their hero moment, where they'll have to make the split-second decision to take someone's life, keeping them consistently on edge and ready to kill at a moment's notice, even if the situation doesn't warrant it. It's also important to bring up the police's real role in this world. Much like in our own world, the main purpose of the police is to maintain stability and protect capital. We can also extrapolate from the fact that cops in Disco Elysium are heavily based on American cops, or at least the pop culture image of them produced in Hollywood. That these cops probably also share a lot of the same problems cops in our world have. Being tools of the capitalists to defend property at the detriment of human lives, in many parts of the world, especially in the United States, you can see how cops will brutalize and even kill people they're sworn to protect, all in defense of the property of rich capitalists who wouldn't even notice a dent in their bottom line or quality of life, no matter how many windows get smashed or stores get looted. There are three main acts that define the RCM's responsibilities. The Emergency Act, the Wayfarer Act, and the Aliments Act. The Emergency Act is the most important of the three acts, as it is what gives the RCM its authority to police its citizens. This act also makes it legal for officers to take bribes, so long as they're properly logged as donations. This act also makes it so businesses are allowed to withhold information from police, so long as that information is related to trade secrets. The Wayfarer Act is designed to limit the authority of local officials and institutions. This provision prohibits RCM officers from demanding operator licenses or evicting citizens from a public space, and presumably grants the right for citizens' words to not be used against them in court. Sadly, we know nothing about the Elements Act, as it is only mentioned by name. The primary purpose of these laws is to limit the power of the police, but not in any meaningful way. It's just another overstepping measure of the moral intern to limit the power of the people of Revachal. While I'm normally all for limiting the power of the police, the limitations placed on them by these laws don't actually protect people as much as it protects property and capitalism as a whole, since the only protection this offers citizens is the right to not reveal trade secrets, which only serves to protect the capitalists that operate within Revachal. Police are freely allowed to murder anyone they so choose and take bribes, but the only thing they can't do is interfere with the secret affairs of corporations. Disco Elysium is a fantastic game with lots to learn about the world and the political systems within. You can tell the developers really cared about attention to detail and wanted to make a game that was enjoyable while also allowing room for the more lore canny among us to really delve into this world and learn all there is to know. You really get the freedom to express your own political views in the game and this really helps you get immersed into the world. My first playthrough of this game was playing as an overly apologetic communist. But I think for my next run, I'll play as a superstar fascist cop in the vein of 80s action films just to see how much things can change. 
The game is enjoyable from beginning to end and makes you feel as if every decision actually matters. For the first hour or two of playing, I even resisted picking up money that I found lying around because I was worried I would get scolded or in trouble for stealing. I think Disco Elysium will be remembered as a modern day classic and I hope that RPGs in the future will take inspiration and learn from this game. I hope you walk away from this video with a better understanding of the world of Disco Elysium and maybe even a better understanding of the politics in our own society. If you have any questions, whether it's about this video or anything else, leave a comment down below and I'll try my best to get back to everyone. I really enjoyed my time with it, getting background info and making this video. If you liked this, give this video a like. If you loved it, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. I'm excited to start my next deep dive into the world and politics of games, but until then, I'll see you in the next video. I would often go there To the tiny church there The smallest church in San San Though it once was larger How the real may rest there Down through the mist there Toward the Seven Sisters Toward those pale cliffs there I would often stay there In a tiny yard there I have been so glad here Looking forward to the past here But now You are all alone None of this matters no, none of this matters at all.